David the Giant Killer. Perhaps the most familiar story to every boy and girl who has attended Sunday school, even for a limited time, is the story of David and Goliath. It is a thrilling story with splendid spiritual truths that are applicable to our present-day lives as believers. But the greater thrill is on the spiritual side. We often miss the spiritual overtones that are here because of the spectacular exploit of David. But the road to the spiritual is through the action recorded in Scripture. And this morning, I dare to retrace these events though they be ever so familiar to you today. Israel was fighting their ancient and warlike enemy, the Philistines. Even from the very beginning, they were the enemies of Israel. After all, they were in that land, and they had been put out, or at least they had been moved to the edge. God at the beginning told Moses he would not take Israel by the short route, the coast route up to Palestine because of the presence of the Philistines and he said he did not want to discourage the people because of these warlike Philistines. You will find that all during the time of the judges they were the enemies of Israel and especially during the time of Samson the Philistines were the enemies. And when we come now to the story of David, we find that the Philistines are still the enemy. But at this time, they had a giant of a man by the name of Goliath. Goliath means soothsayer, which would seem to indicate that this man not only was a great hulk of a man physically and had physical strength, but he dealt with the occult. He dealt with that which was demonic. This man was six cubits, we're told, and if we're accurate about the cubit, it must have been somewhere around 18 inches. It means he was nine feet and one span, and a span is about nine inches. Here's not Mr. Five by Five, but Mr. Nine by Nine. Almost ten feet tall, if you please. And at this time, because of the presence of this giant, the war had come to a stalemate. They were stymied because this giant came out each day. And Israel on one side of the hill and the Philistines on the other and down in the valley, there paraded this giant. And Israel cringed in a cowardly fashion by the boasting and braggadocio of this man. It was at this juncture that Jesse sent David his son he was the youngest son. He sent him to bring provisions for his brothers and also a token to the captain of the hosts of Israel. And while David was in the camp, he brought what, actually, if you read it very carefully, it's amounted to K rations. He brought in rations for his brothers. And while he was in the camp, Goliath came forth. And believe me, David was incensed by this. Will you notice? David spake to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircum Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? That's brave talk for a shepherd boy. But David was one who had a consuming passion for God. David had his faults, and David committed sin, but no man ever had the feeling and the love and the consuming passion for God that this man had. Amazing man David was, and this thing, I tell you, it didn't put him down back of a rock to hide in fear, when he wanted something done about it. And probably this talk was not pleasing to his older brother. And you can imagine an elder brother 
in a situation like this. And we read, And Eliab the eldest brother heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Big brother. Big brother didn't like what David was saying. And after all, it's quite interesting to notice, Eliab can get angry at David, but he's not angry at the Philistine. David is angry with the Philistine, and he wants something done about that. Well, this word got to King Saul, and David's brought before King Saul because he's willing now to take on the giant. And, of course, the normal, natural thing to do, he tried on his armor. It didn't fit. Someone has said that the armor of God is awkward wear for easy chair. But that wasn't really the problem. The problem was that David could not use, as he makes it very clear, he could not use the instruments and the methods of this world to fight the world. And so he has to make the effort, but it didn't work. And he said, if you don't mind, I go back to that which I'm an expert at. And he was. And I turn now down to the 40th verse as David goes forward. He took his staff in his hand and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistines. Now, I think we ought to have something very clear. The idea seems to me, as I hear it explained, that it was sort of an accident, really, when David smashed him right in the eye. Actually, that was not the everyday thing. May I say to you that David knew where he was going to put the stone. There would be no question about that in his mind. He had no qualms whatsoever. And the interesting thing is, David was not the only man in Israel that knew how to use a sling. Go back a little farther. I think I called attention on Thursday night some time ago to the 20th chapter of Judges, verse 16, where we are told this, and it may have escaped you. Among all this people, there were 700 chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at a hairbreadth and not miss. That means that there were 700 men and you could give each one of them a stone and you could put down 700 hairs. I don't know how many paces. It'd have to be pretty close to me. But regardless of how far away it was, those 700 men could break those hairs. David is not the only one that could use a slingshot. And if you feel this morning that this is something that all of a sudden, that more or less accidental, it's not true. David was an expert. Just think of the days he spent out yonder with the sheep using that. I suppose many times a sheep would stray off and he would see a bush and one berry on a bush beyond the sheep. It's our practice. And he takes the slingshot, knocks the berry off the bush. If he missed, well, he didn't miss. David didn't miss. I think that is the thing that we should understand, that David had absolute confidence in the thing that he was going to do. But we are told here that he took with him five smooth stones. Somebody says, he evidently intended that in case that he missed, he'd have a few extra shots left. May I say to you that the reason he took the extra, if you would turn over to 2 Samuel, the 21st chapter, verse 22, you'd find out why. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. When the giant Goliath paraded up and down each day, he had four sons as big as he was over yonder in the Philistine camp. And they watched Papa go up and down every day. 
And David took five stones, one for each boy. But the boys didn't come out that day. They did later. And David and his men got rid of them later on. But David had only one stone for Goliath. What a tremendous thing. Now, when the giant saw David, that he was a boy, and the impression is that he was just a little bitty fella, David was a pretty good hulk of a man himself. I think David was as fine a looking king as Saul ever was. He was red headed, hot tempered, but he was a man. But the giant saw his youth. And he became boastful and he became insulting. And if you notice the story, when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. Go on back. I don't want you. I'm not moving to the cradle yet. I don't want to fight you. You are just a boy. And he curses him. He cursed him by his gods. And did you notice how this man answers him. There are tremendous spiritual lessons here. They're profound. The giant came on. And David let him have it. One stone. Now the miracle is that of course that this great hawk of a man that had threatened Israel and had everyone a coward that this boy knowing what he could do did step out And his faith and confidence was absolutely in God, if you please. And we're going to see that. I won't go ahead and finish the story other than to say that it's something that all of you know, that David slew the giant and the victory was his. May I say that I'm anxious this morning to draw a spiritual lesson from this. David is, in Scripture, a picture of Christ. He's a small adumbration of Christ. And if you will follow our Lord very carefully, you will notice how often that he would say this. Have you never read what David did under similar circumstances? And he was constantly referring to David. He was a son of David. He was to occupy and shall someday occupy the throne of David. And David is just a small picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. May I say, I believe, and here's where some might disagree with me, but I think there's tremendous spiritual lessons here. I think the giant represents the world. And I think Saul, as we shall see tonight, represents Satan. Conflict finally between God and Satan, David and Saul, for that's where it will finally come to. But now it's with the world. When you and I first come to Christ, the world is our enemy. I'm not talking now about the world of people. It's not that. It's a world system, the cosmos. That's the enemy of the believer. Our Lord made it very clear. Will you notice What he said in John 15, verse 18, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Something's wrong with your testimony if the world loves you. Something wrong today with your life if you are living side by side today with the world. And John again, in 1 John 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Listen, David treated Goliath as an enemy, an enemy of himself, an enemy of his people, and as an enemy of God. Samson treated the Philistines as friends, and he married a couple of them. 
That's the difference. And that explains today the defeat of literally thousands of believers today. Some are Samson's, some are David's. David says, the Philistine is my enemy. And I must have a victory over him. Samson said, the way to do is to have a united nation. and We'll all get together. And my beloved, it was to the downfall and destruction of Samson, it was a victory for David. Our Lord says you're in the world, but you're not of the world. And the very interesting thing is that you and I cannot fight the world with its own weapons, with its own methods. David found that out. Will you listen now to David? Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. David said to the giant, this is tremendously important, you're coming to me with the weapons of the world. I am not fighting you with the weapons of the world. We have no fight today with the world with its weapons. You have to have a spiritual weapon, and that weapon happens to be faith. Verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. May I say to you, that was the faith of David. You remember that John says in 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You and I cannot use the weapons of the world, but by faith today we can overcome. And now I come to that verse where this morning we want to pause, verse 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. You have that same picture, Jericho. That's the same identical picture. The battle is the Lord's, and that's what Joshua learned. He didn't fight Jericho. He marched around Jericho. What? By faith the walls of Jericho fell down when they were compassed about seven days. The battle is the Lord. David says, I can't use this armor. I don't want this sword. I go forth in the name of the Lord. And though he's an expert with that sling, his confidence is in God. And if there's one thing that I've learned the past week is that you and I here trust second causes. Down yonder, they don't. You and I rest upon the second causes today. You and I, to ever have a victory over the world, we'll have to learn for the battle is the Lord. He has to get the victory over the world. You and I cannot. May I translate this now into shoe leather? May I tell you that this morning that this walks through the jungles of Mexico, and I've seen this in action. Saturday night a week ago, at Cuernavaca, where this conference was held, 50 miles south of Mexico City, I was reading and I threw the Bible program and I came to this verse and I give you my word, I think I have read it 50 times, but I don't think I'd ever noticed this expression. I'm sure you'd noticed it. I had not. For the battle 
is the Lord's. I asked him for a verse because the next morning we would go on a trip by a little plane another 150 miles south into the jungle. A week ago this morning, we got up very early, about five. We ate breakfast about six. And then we drove south through the city of Cuernavaca. It's been a resort city in the past. Acapulco has taken its place now, and it may be on the way down, but it's still a very quaint little city with its winding streets, strange structures, extreme poverty here, and wealth right next to it. No wonder communism can flourish. And as we drove through the city, it was the rainy season and everything was fresh. It had rained all that night. And there was the fragrance of strange and exotic flowers. I'd never smelt before, but it was mingled with the most pungent, putrid, and sickening odors I have ever smelt in my life. Soon we were out in the open country because there was not much traffic at that time. We're in one of the most beautiful valleys I've ever seen. We drove about 20 miles south to a so-called landing strip. I wouldn't dignify it with that name. It's just a corner of a pasture, and how in the world you can ever find it, I don't know. But we had with us one of the Missionary Aviation Fellowship pilots, Hatch Hatcher, I'll never forget him, but genial Oklahoman with a smile that's worth a million dollars and a heart, a heart that sets forth to everyone that meets him that he's a real child of God. And I want to say a word of appreciation to these pilots, the Missionary Aviation Fellowship. They don't take any chances. Although you may think we did when I tell you what I want to tell you this morning. But we got in this light, frail craft, one motor. He tested it out. The Mexican that had slept there that night watching it, he gave him a few pesos and off we were gone. And our destination was still south over a range of mountains straight ahead about 9,000 feet high. And it wasn't long until we were up around 10,000. It began to get cool. Clouds were already gathering around the tops of the mountains. It's the rainy season in Mexico. It's clear of a morning, but in the afternoon the clouds come in it rains. And we were in a hurry. We wanted to get back that evening. And we went over this range of mountains, and when we did, it was clear as crystal ahead and may I say to you that when we got to the top and looked down, I saw, I believe, the most breathtaking scene that I've ever beheld in my life. Below was the rugged jungle for 100 miles, almost impenetrable. And 100 miles ahead was a range of mountains 10,000 feet high. And we went over them. I felt like I could put my foot out and touch the top when we went over. I hope the pictures that I took on this trip will be good. I hope those pictures are. I'd love for you to see that beauty. Down beneath, you could see a village here, a village there. You could look back and see Popo, the volcanic that's covered with snow. You could see the sleeping lady, also covered with snow. And after one hour's flight and climbing to 11,500 feet, we could see the other side to the jungle and could even see the ocean in the distance, the Pacific. That jungle below was impenetrable. We were then in 15 minutes of our destination. If you should pack in, it would take you five days to go in it would take you five days to come out. I've never been sold on aeroplanes for missionaries, but I am now. 
If I had packed in, I'd still be down there, either going in or coming out. And I think if I got in, I'd never get out that way. But you know, it seemed but a minute. We were over the village of Su Chisla Wasa. Time you say it, you passed over it. And if you don't believe that that's the way to pronounce it, let me spell it for you. X O C H I S T L A H U A C A. So you can see I pronounced it accurately. I found out that the Indian names, you pronounce them exactly like they don't sound. The missionaries had a great deal of fun listening to me mention the names. But may I say that we circled the village. Hatch wanted me to get pictures, and I took pictures as we circled over. Then we went out to the little air strip, and again, it ought not to be called that, was covered with burrows and goats and dogs and natives. And how we got down, I shall never know. He circled the landing strip. He's very careful. It's a peculiar landing strip. You come over a little hill. There is a pond beneath. You go uphill, and you must stop soon enough, because when you get to the top, it's 2,000 or 1,000, I don't know which, to me they're the same, feet down, and you have to stop. And as you can see, we did. These circles, they never land unless they are sure about the little landing strip. And may I say to you that when we landed, all of these native Christians came running out, these Indians. The young man who's the missionary there has been there 19 years. He speaks the language, of course, as a native. He has translated now practically the New Testament, he's just finishing it, into their language. And I have never seen the sight that I saw when we opened the door of the plane and stepped out and these natives came rushing up to him, these native Christians. He put his arm around them, and they put their arms around him. My friend, I saw Christian love in action. I don't think we know what it is. Really, I don't. I wish I could tell you this morning the feeling that came over me as I stood there and watched that scene. We went first up to his home, and believe me, you ought not to call it a home. I stood there with Lauren Grisette down here at Santa Ana, and I said, Lauren, I just finished painting my little bungalow up in Pasadena. I've always loved it. But I say I can stand here and thank God that he's permitted me to live there when I see where this missionary is living but I'll never be as comfortable there again, having seen where he's living. The minute he opens this door, mud thing, tin roof, the natives swarm in, the believers. And I said to him, do you have this all the time? He says, we never close the door. When they eat, they come in and sit and watch them as they did us. You just don't have any privacy. I said, well, why don't you sometimes close your door? He said, we didn't come down here to shut ourselves away from them. We came down here to reach them, and that's the way they live. Their door is open. Dogs and pigs and everybody goes in. And I want to tell you that that fellow Stuart is one of the sharpest young men. He can come back to America any day and fill anybody's pulpit. He's given his life to those few thousand. Our moose goes. That's the tribe we visited. Well, we stayed there for a little while, and a little girl came up. Prettiest little thing you've ever seen. Pretty as any of your children. She came up, and she had a, a little bowl, a little, one of these little plate pots with eight eggs in it. She presented it to me, and she began to talk. She, she can't understand why I was so stupid not to know what she was saying, but I didn't. <laughs> the missionary says that her mother has sent you these eggs to express her Christian love for you, the pastors come down to visit. 
He said to me, he says, that's what they were going to have today with tortillas. And that's all they've got. I said, let me give them back. He says, don't you dare give them back. You keep them. That's a sacrifice. When they gave eight eggs, that's like you giving $8,000. That's all they had for dinner except tortillas. And I felt like a dirty dog taking those eggs. Well, what do you do? I took them. Then after we visited there, the service had already started up at the little church. You see, they have a four-hour service. Then we walked down the hill, by that pond, up a hill, and it was hot then. It was the humidity of that jungle. And I began to perspire. I have never been as hot coming from 10,000 feet where you're cold down there so quickly. I tell you, I began to get just a little dizzy in time I got inside the church, the little humble church. And this time last week, I sat there, no backs on the seat. They made them. And I sat there and, and I listened. The service was in progress. It was led by Amado, a crippled boy. I said, boy, they all look young to me, but I understand that he's probably in his fifties. Most of them don't know how old they are. They were quoting scripture. And they have the little book that Wycliffe has made, the translation. Amado was following them as they would quote. And the congregation quoted. Suppose this morning that we just took our service here and let you quote scripture. How long would we go? That's what they did. They were quoting John 14, John 15. And then when I got in John 16, I got lost. Every time that somebody stand up and quote a little, a motto would explain it. And the missionary would then would tell me what he was saying. And I want to tell you, for a man that never saw a commentary, a fellow says exegesis was mighty good. Yet they have a spiritual insight apparently we don't have. And I sat there. And you know, for me to sit two hours on a bench that doesn't have a back on it is tremendous. And I got hot and I got sick. And I was really sick. But I want to tell you that I've never been as thrilled because I sat there and felt something. I can't speak their language. They can't speak English. And back and forth, there was no communication except through the missionary. But I felt something, my friend, that came through, and that's Christian love. After that, the pastor, narrow, fine young man, and he's as sharp as any of us here on the platform. If you think that their IQ's not high, that's the thing that the anthropologist is having trouble with today, why Stone Age people are so brilliant. I have a boy to tell you about later on that can make any Ph.D. in this country ashamed of himself. He had no training whatsoever. But he's a missionary in Germany today. He already speaks five languages. He picked up French in three months and was preaching. I studied the stuff for years and I can't talk any. By that time, I was beginning to become very humble. All they knew I was a pastor. They never heard of Los Angeles. They never heard of the Church of the Open Door, and they never heard of its pastor. But I never was so thrilled as I sat there and listened to Narrow, the pastor. And by the way, he receives no salary. Well, if that's an idea, we may work on that here. <laughs> As his little farm out there, farm, big as one of these sections where it grows corn. Tortillas is the main diet, of course, and a few beans, that's about all. And when he was introduced to me after the service, we were outside, and it was made clear to him that I was a pastor from way up north somewhere. He gave me what the Mexicans call them brasso. He just threw his arms around me, and he wanted me to know he loved me. You don't see that up here, friends. Then they fixed the dinner for us. 
I was told when I went to Mexico, be careful of the restaurants you eat in, even in Mexico City. My friends, when you're among Christians like that, and you can see the amoebas coming in by arm as you go ahead and eat, and trust the Lord. And they stood around and watched. <laughs> the next day we had another one, only this time they were not even as clean as they were there. And we just had to think of other things when we ate. But honestly, delicious food. And they prepared it. They said, because you come down to visit us and you're our Christian brothers. I've never heard things like that. And then time came for us to leave. Clouds were gathering. Way down toward the coast, you could see rain. And so you got to get off that little landing strip. And Hatch, he wouldn't take us all off at once. He took us one at a time. And in one day's hike, there's a little, uh, another landing strip that the Southern Presbyterians have at another village, another tribe. It's just 15 minutes by air, of course. And he took Mr. Grisette over there and then came back for the missionary and myself. I went out to get the picture, and I hope it's good, of that little old plane come bouncing over the hill and taking off. And then I stood out there on that landing field. The missionary was up at his house, closing up the house and getting certain things ready because Hatch would be back in a few minutes. And then when the plane took off, all of a sudden I discovered I was alone with these people. And they crowded around me on every side, looked up at me, smiled, and friends, I do not know how to explain it to you this morning, but Christian love came through. I was telling Cameron Townsend that. He said, if you'd been there 20 years before, they would have killed you, cut your head off, and he shrunk it. I said, this time they did not take my head off, and they didn't kill me, but they sure did shrink my head. If you want to get your head shrunk, my Christian friend, you go down and see what some people have today that you and I do not have. We have the lovely church of the open door, and we have a worldwide reputation, and nobody's heard of the moose goes and narrow the pastor. But as I stood there and he came up to my side, I felt like if he had any shoes on, I'd have got down and shined them for him. But he's barefooted. All of them are barefooted. I thought that plane never would get back. I can't talk to them. I'm standing there, and finally, after about 15 minutes, the missionary came out. And I said, I'm sure glad you got here. Here you stand in the midst of people, alone. And I thought, suppose that plane doesn't get back here. In a few minutes, the missionary said to me, he says, it's coming. I said, how do you know? I can't hear or see a thing. He says, they have ears sharper than we do. They've just told me. It's coming. And you know, they were right. In less than five minutes, here Hatch came in and landed and then took the missionary and myself off. Again, they came around and gave us a wonderful, wonderful send-off. God have mercy on me if I ever forget that trip. And the Christian love I saw among those humble believers among the moose though. Well, we took off and we had to go and pick Lauren Grisette. I was for leaving him because the clouds were coming in. But we decided we better go by and pick him up. And we went over and landed on this last strip of the Southern Presbyterian Church. And I told him, I said, I have a perfect right here. I used to be a Southern Presbyterian. I was educated in that church. So I felt I had a right on the airstrip. And it was good meeting some of those folk over there. And then, I've never seen folk that can kill time as they do down there. I thought we'd never get ready. We had to pump up tires on the plane. They had to put in gas. And they don't do it like they should do it. They just kill time. And the rain is coming up. And I said, fellas, let's go. 
I said, I'd like to stay down here, but because that's when I gave my testimony to the folk. I said, I wish we could stay longer, and it looks like that's what we were going to do. But we took off then, and we went over this first range. This time we went up 12,500 feet in that little plane to get over the clouds now. And then we went through, not through clouds, Hatch told me to be sure and not say that because Missionary Aviation Fellowship never flies like that. We stayed above those clouds. But my friend, when we flew that hundred miles and looked down, and you could look down, I saw waterfalls higher than Niagara. I saw jungle and rivers, trees. My, what a sight. Then we came to the last range and by this time it was covered with mountains. And I said, I told you fellas that you ought to hurry. And I could see even then that Hatch was just a little concerned. And I saw him edging to the right, and he kept edging to the right, and I couldn't see what he was edging to because it's just as cloudy over there to me. And when we got over there, friend, I give you my word, there was an opening. And we went in, but I, it ended. It looked to me like it's going to end. I never turned corners in a plane before, but we turned corners. We got here, and you could look down another way, and it was open. And he just turned and went down that way, and when he got there, it was open another way, and we, went, we just kept zigzagging. And all of a sudden, we came out. I thought of the scripture of Isaiah, where he said, I will lead them in a way they've not gone. And I'd never been that way before. <laughs> May I say to you that when we finally got through zigzagging, we came out. I could see a lake ahead, the little landing strip. A corner of that pasture was by a lake. And Hatch looked back at me and smiled with that great smile. I was sure glad to see it. And he said to me, he says, there is the lake, and our landing strip is down there, and it's downhill all the way. And in 30 minutes, we had landed. May I say to you this morning, friend, I went back there to see this statement, the battle is the Lord. For while we were there, the first convert, an older man, very intelligent man, so the missionary said, came up and told him that while he was gone to the conference that the Roman Catholic priests had stirred up the town and the town council had met and called him in and told him in order to restore unity in the town that all of the evangelicals must now come back into the Roman Catholic Church. The same bishop that gave that order to the priest is the same one that just the week before in another tribe where he also has charge gave the order that the chapel of the evangelicals would be burned and it was burned and they would not take me there because they said it was all stirred up and it would not be well for a white man, a strange white man to go in there. This morning the Amuscos may not have a chapel, I don't know. But I do know this, if they have a chapel, they are there right now. And God forgive me if I ever forget them. I saw real Christian love without being able to understand one word. Not one of them can speak one word of English except the little boy when I left, came up and he says, Hello! <laughs> and I said to him, Hello! And he smiled. And that's the only English word I heard. But the way I say to you, Christian love came through. I wish this morning I could take you down there. I wish I could take the Church of the Open Door down there. I do know this. We'd have a different church next week. Shall we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we this morning think of that 
group of Amuskos. Some of them have never been out of that jungle. And yet, they've come to know thee. And today they exhibit Christian love. We think of that 12 or 15 men that have left the tribe this morning and gone out to other villages, and they're preaching the gospel because they believe that every Christian should witness. Oh, God bless them. Be with them. And forgive us for our coldness and our pride and our indifference. Somehow or another, may the Spirit of God break through our hard shell and make us the kind of believers we should be today. Not just civilized, not just well-dressed, but those that have the love of Christ in their hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.